Okay, do you have any preference? Should we start with the uh, Google Doc questions? Yes. Okay, let's start with that. Okay. All right. I tell you what, I look at this one here. Can you go over question three? This, this one is about proving the correctness for recursion about its prime. I would say that one is a little bit too difficult for us for now. So I would say you don't have to worry about it. Okay, but I will do something simpler instead to show you the pattern. Because on the exam, it's definitely a different question. I don't think going over the specifics about the property of a prime number will really help you a lot for the exam. So I'd rather go over another simpler one, which your colleague posted later in the Google Doc, to show you the pattern. That'll be more beneficial to you. Okay, how about that? But I would say for this one, it's prime. It's uh, too specific about the property for prime number, so you wouldn't gain too much from that. Okay, that's what I would say. But I'll get to a simpler example. How about you go there directly? So one of the questions over there is about a simple, uh, let me see, okay. Okay, this one here, but I will I just put it on my iPad. So let's have a look. All right, let me just move the slides to here. That's a bit better. All right, let's consider this very simple recursive method, okay? And the interesting bit about this example here is if you look at the code, it's incredibly easy, right? Very easy. Very similar to how we do factorial, very similar, except that you can see we're doing uh, addition rather than uh, multiplication. Okay, but now, the interesting thing about this example is, is the application you have is geometric. Okay, let's see. So what we are really doing here is we are trying to count how many blocks there are in a triangle. For example, if you have a block like this, let's say, let's say this. You always start, let's say start with the bottom. Let's say at the bottom there, I got four blocks. Let me just draw carefully. Okay, one block, two, three, and then four. That's the first row, okay? And then the second row, we got one, and then two, and then three, strictly less. Okay, one less. And then we got another one here, another one here, and then one here. Okay, you can see that's more or less like a triangle. So the task over here is, if I tell you how many rows we have, for example, in this case, we got one, two, three, four. The number of rows is actually four. How do you count the summation of all the blocks together? In this case, that should be four plus three plus two plus one. In that case, you get uh, 10, right? So that's kind of the problem. So now, what we want to do is, if I give you, for example, 10, let's say the height of the triangle is actually 10, which means we got a triangle like this, let's say this, something like that. So we start with the bottom row over here, which is 10. And then the height of the triangle over here is you got 10 rows. So now, how many blocks are there? So that's kind of the problem we are trying to solve. So you will simply call number of blocks, I would say number of blocks, and they'll pass 10. And then hopefully this is going to return to me some number that represents the sum. Okay? Is it clear what the problem is? Okay, let's study the code very quickly, and then we'll prove its correctness. Okay? So now, let's look at the code over here. Again, the way you study recursion is, first of all, look at the base cases. Okay? If you want to study back the prime number, it's the same. Always look at the base cases. And here, in this case, we only got one base case. Uh, let's highlight it. So you have, if the number of rows is just one. So what's that case, really? So what kind of triangle is that? Well, basically, what we are talking about is you just have a single block like that, and that's it. That's a very special case, in which case you can just return one. There's no counting you should do in this case, right? And now, what if we got, let's say, two rows? In that case, we got, let's say, two at the bottom row, and then we got another one stacked on top. In that case, we got to do a little bit more work. It's not just base case, okay? So that means the, base ca uh, the recursive case is the one we should worry about over here, okay? That's a recursive case. So what are we returning? We are returning, basically, it's more like a combination of two things. So we are returning something from the recursion over here, and then we're returning whatever row that we have currently. Let's say if we are already in the bottom row, let's say over here. If we are in the bottom rows, we know very well that this row over here is contained exactly 10. However, what about the rest? The rest over here is too complicated for me to solve it right away. So what I can do is I can delegate to some recursive call and assuming that it is correct. That's what we can do. And you do similar assumption when you prove the correctness. 
So now what about the rest? The rest is basically like I just got a strictly smaller problem. Let me highlight a different color. Let's say the green one. If you look at the green one over here, it's simply just another triangle that is strictly smaller. So what will be the heights for this triangle in this case? 9, exactly. That will be the original triangle. You can see the original one is 10. And now if I got a strictly smaller one, the height will be just 10 minus 1. So that's 9. So we are solving a strictly smaller problem. So we keep reducing the problem by making further recursive call until we actually reach the base case with a triangle of only height 1. That's what we want to do. Okay? So that's what we're doing here. So whatever rows it might be, so let's say if we start with 10, then that means we're going to say 10 over here, and then we'll say number of blocks, and then 10 minus 1. Right? So we're reducing the problem. That means, now count for me another triangle that's of height 9. Whatever result it is, uh, add it up with, together with 10. And I will get a result for the problem for 10. Okay, that's how you understand this particular method. Again, it's pretty easy to understand, but the, cor the correctness proof will nicely illustrate the, uh, uh, the pattern. Any question about how the method works? Okay. Let's do something very quickly. How, how do we trace it? Okay. Let's say we do something very easy. <coughs> Let's consider this triangle of height 3 only. Let's say we start with 1, and then 2, and then 3. In that case, the height would just be 3. Okay, what we will do is we're going to make a call. We say number of blocks, and then I would say 3. Okay, we know that according to the definition here, 3 is not 1. So we're going to make a recursive call over here. What you will return is, you're going to return two things. You'll return something like this. Let me make it a little bit smaller. So it's going to return two things. First of all, it's going to return number of rows, which is just 3. 3 plus, and then the number of rows by rows minus 1. So that'll be number of rows and then 2. Right? And then this one is not the base case yet, so you will be further divided, and 2 is not 1 yet. So what we'll do is we'll say <coughs> 2 plus number of blocks, 1. And now we have reached the base case, which means this guy here, number of blocks, 1. 1 here matches the 1 here. That means we're going to return 1 from here. So that means we got 1 here. And then, how do we calculate the number of blocks for 2? In that case, that'll be 2 plus the number of blocks for 1, which is 1. And then we got 2 plus 1, so we got 3. And then, now, if we go back to the previous one, the previous call, originally we wanted to calculate <coughs> for number of blocks, 3. Now we know already number of blocks for 2 would be 3. Combine that with the bottom row, which is 3, which is over here, right? So this is 3 here. And this is the number of blocks for two, right? And then we got six in total. Are we OK with this uh, method here? OK, that's about <coughs> just the tracing the programming. Now, <coughs> sorry. How do we prove its correctness? The correctness proof will be very similar to how we interpret the, uh, how it works in, uh, in, the, in the runtime. So here's the idea. What I will do is, let me just uh, copy this block here and then put it in the next slides. Okay. So we can uh, just focus on the correctness proof. Okay. Now the same block of code, let's see how we can prove it. Okay. So correctness proof. So let's see what the problem is. So now we want to prove the following. Number of blocks, and then you pass simply some number of uh, some integer n. And then where, well, let's assume, n is larger than 0, just positive. Can be 1, can be 2, and so on. Returns the number of blocks of a triangle of height n. Okay. So that's the uh, proof we would like to do. Okay, that's maybe something you'll be given. You'll be, you'll be given the code, and you'll be given uh, what the property of the code is. And now we want to prove it. Okay? Now, how do we prove it? Again, we got two, uh, two cases. We got base case, and also we got recursive case. For recursive case, we have to first make an inductive hypothesis, and then try to use it for reducing the result for the original problem. That's kind of the step. Okay? Now, let's see conceptually what we really mean. 
we have to prove the base case. Let's go, uh, go case by case. So number one, base case. Let me use green. So now, so here's the proof. Let's start with the proof. Okay. Step number one, base case. For the base case, let's consider just a single block like this. Okay. This is a single block with uh, just uh, with height one. So base case triangle. It's not exactly triangle, but as far as we're concerned for this problem, it's a triangle of height one. Okay, we know that conceptually, so this is conceptually. So this conceptually, we know that for this one, it's simply just one, it's trivial. And now we have to link back to our code, which line actually does this. Okay, let me just uh, make some line number over here. So let's say line number one, line number two, line number three, just make it very easy, okay, one, two, and three. And now in this case, we can say line one returns one. Okay, that's how we prove the base case. We know that conceptually, if you only got a single triangle of height one, it should be one. And line one, the blue one, does exactly that. Okay, that's a base case. Okay, base case should always be easy. So you should always start with the base cases before you reach the recursive case. And now for the recursive case, you can do just half of it just by uh, stating the uh, inductive hypothesis. But let's see how we can do that. So now, all we want to do is, let's say step number two, okay? For step number two, we want to prove the recursive case. Recursive case. So in this case, we have a triangle of heights. Okay, you can see that we have this parameter over here, which is rows. So I'll put rows over here. Okay, that's how we start with. And we know that rows is actually guaranteed to be larger than one. Because if it was one, it would have been uh, the base case, which we proved already. Okay, so now let's see some illustration over here. This is what we want to do. If you consider, in general, a triangle like this, okay, let's say the height is rows. Okay, we got this many rows. And now the way we do it is by saying we separate that into two parts. Okay? So this part over here, okay, this part over here. How many, how many blocks do we have for the bottom level? How many? According to the heights, how many? Huh? Oh, well, you know, it's, so here you can see the, the rows here can be any number, right? The rows can be five, yes. It can be two, it can be six, it can be 10. So depending on what rows is, right? So now you should really say, now we're getting a little bit more abstract. So it would be rows. Would it help you a little bit? Let's say this, you know, I'll try to make it a little bit easier for you. Let's say, let's have a better name for the variables. Let's call this, rather than rows, let's call it n. Okay, might be a little bit easier for you. And now I'll change, uh, just the same, I'll just uh, renaming consist, uh, uh, systematically. Okay, rows should be n, and also rows over here should be n. Okay, the, the, the code will work uh, the same way. So now of heights, n. Now it'll be better. So that means over here we have the heights is n. So now according to this uh, general triangle, how many blocks do we have at the bottom? N, right? Just N. For example, in the case where, if uh, in the case where uh, uh, the N is equal to four, that means we got one, two, three, four. Okay, good. And now that's the first part. And now, what about the remaining part? The remaining part basically is going to be what I'm highlighting over here. Okay, this part here. This is the remaining part. And this remaining part over here is basically another triangle, another strictly smaller triangle of heights, and then uh, m minus 1. Okay, just reducing the, the uh, last level. This is how we're going to prove it. We're going to assume that there is such a method for us to calculate this part of the triangle, which is of height m minus one, correctly, we can assume. That's gonna be our inductive hypothesis, which is exactly this call over here. We assume such thing. And then we say that in order to calculate the heights 
for this strictly larger triangle with uh, an extra button level. In that case, what would be the sum of the blocks? It should be whatever result this return plus the button level, right? That would be conceptually the, the way to go, OK? So let's write it out in the proof, OK? So now let's see how we can write it. So now I would say, first of all, we have inductive hypothesis, OK? What's inductive hypothesis? We are assuming that n o b number of blocks of n minus 1 returns the number of blocks of a triangle of heights n minus 1. OK? And there's one thing I want to draw your attention to, because it's almost always the case. If you look at the blue one over here and the blue one over here, they look almost the same. Don't you agree? It's intentional. Because you can see that the, the little bit deeper, uh, the darker blue over here, we're talking about a problem of size n. And when we are trying to make the inductive hypothesis, we're making a problem of size n minus 1, which is strictly smaller. That's intentional. But we can do that according to mathematical uh, induction. So now we're assuming that this is the case, right? So now this is what we assume. Inductive hypothesis and then n minus 1. OK, now, what, what do we go on? We want to really state the general solution, how it should be computed conceptually. And then we will point back to the code. This is exactly what we do. OK, so let's do that. So now I'm going to uh, write in red. OK, let me separate that. OK, so now I would say to compute number of blocks, OK, to compute the number of blocks of a triangle of height okay, n. According to this diagram over here, okay, so as part of your proof, you can draw this diagram. We have the following. n plus the number of blocks of a triangle. You know what? Let me just write it a little bit better. Okay, so you can see exactly the two parts. We have n plus the number of blocks, the number of blocks of a triangle of heights, n minus 1. OK, so there are two parts to the solution in general. So now we want to see exactly which part is corresponded by which, which part of our code, right? So now if you look at that, so now what we can do is, first of all, if you look at this n here, is exactly the n over here. Agree? And this is line number three. Okay, I'll put line number three. n. That's exactly there. So we're always making, making some connection back to the code. And now what about this part? Well, this part here, you can see that how do we link? You can see this is more like a description. We are going to get a correct result for the number of blocks of a strictly smaller triangle of height, n minus 1. So which part of the code should we link to? Should be this part here, right? So this is the part we should link to. OK, let me just write it down. So that'll be line number three, also number of blocks, and then n minus 1. But now here's a question for you. How do we know that, how do we know, this is the most important part. How do we know, uh, maybe a orange, how do we know this particular recursive call is going to correctly return this expected result. How do we know that? How do we know? Uh, no, not, not true. OK, this is very critical. Uh, no, not quite. So that's according to the inductive hypothesis, exactly. OK, guys, let me mention this again. It's very important. You're going to follow exactly this kind of pattern when you do the exam on Friday. It will be a different problem, but the step will be very similar. Do the base case, and then you think about conceptually how you solve a general problem here. You can draw a diagram if you want. And then after that, you state the inductive hypothesis, which will be very similar to the original problem, except the problem size will be strictly smaller. right? And then after that, you're going to argue that now, to really compute the original problem, 
this is what we have. Usually you got several parts for the solution, for the general problem. And many parts will be having chorus, uh, direct correspondence back to your code, for example, n over here, okay? Except that usually for this part here, let's say this part here, when I say the number of blocks of triangle of a height that's n minus one, it's a strictly smaller problem. How do we know we get a correct solution for that? Well, it's simply because you got your inductive hypothesis over here. Because we assume, oh, let me just be a little bit more, not so messy here. Because we, we assume the number of blocks is gonna be computed by NOB of uh, N minus one, okay? So now, okay, just that's the most critical step, all right? So I'm gonna say, and this part here is by the inductive hypothesis. Okay, so now, let me just uh, finish the proof over here. Okay, and then we say, by inductive hypothesis, we know NOB N minus one returns the expected result. Okay, and this completes the proof. All right? So there are many components over here you want to watch for. Okay, any question about this particular example? It's simple enough, but I think it does illustrate many things that we talk about for recursion. Mm -hmm. oh, except, except for one more thing. How do you formulate a recurrence relation for this one? Which might be also on the exam, right? Let, let's do it together. It's very easy, right? And now let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, and there's another, there was another example I posted yesterday about the uh, is sorted, right? You should really go over that proof as well. So that, again, illustrate a pattern. So that should really prepare you well for the exam. All right, so let's do one more thing about this example here. So now what about running time? Running time. How would you specify the recurrence relation? Let's say you're given this in the exam. How would you do it? Well, recurrence relation is gonna be, based, uh, let's say, usually we just say T, right? T of something over here. And the question mark there tells you the input size. In this case, it's like how high the triangle is. Anyone wanna try? How many equations should we have in this case for the running time? T, okay, T M minus one. Okay, plus some constant, right? Okay, basically you're talking about, okay, when you talk about this case E here, it's really the recursive case over here. Because we know that this is a recursive call. You can think about this like a T. The running time for the original problem over here is gonna be a, sub, a subproblem whose size is simply just minus one. Okay, and then you might have to do some addition and then referring to the variable and also return. So that'll be just plus one. You can just say plus one for constant. We can say plus C for some constant. Okay, is that it? We well, got more. How would you specify the base case? Okay, how do you know it should be T1 rather than T0? Yep, exactly, so you want, you want to look at the code. In this case, you can see that here, the base case is where the, when the problem size is one, that's the base case. So you got T1 is equal to, uh, basically it returns some constant, right? Again, you can just say T1 is one. Okay, so these are the two equations. All right, that's about the recurrence relation. And then, how do you solve it, right? Well, to solve it, again, you gotta do some unfolding, right? How do we do unfolding for this one here? Can you do unfolding in your mind for this one? This one is actually quite easy, but I'll do it anyway. But can you, by doing unfolding, can you actually imagine what the running time will be after the unfolding? Would it be a constant operation? Would it be a linear, quadratic, or log n? Anyone? Constant? Linear. Constant or linear? Make up your mind. N, okay. How about, how about you? 
Linear, okay, linear. Uh, I can tell you it's linear, yes. Okay, let's see quickly. It's, this one is very easy. Let's say we start with Tn. We know that by definition it's going to be Tn minus 1 plus some constant. I'll just say 1. Okay. Now, how do we do the very first unfolding? We're going to substitute, basically, uh, what we want to unfold is n minus 1. That means we're going to substitute every occurrence of n over here by n minus 1. Okay, what we will get is we're going to get t n minus 1 minus 1, right? So it's going to be n minus 2 plus 1. And then that guy here, and then plus 1. Are you okay with this? Well, I actually have done this many times. Make sure you're comfortable. You definitely, uh, you may have to do this on the exam. You may have to. Okay, let's do just one more. Okay, if we do one more over here, what you will see is t uh, n minus 2. In that case, that'll be t n minus 3 plus 1. And then this guy here, plus 1. And the original guy here, plus 1. Okay? So you want to make it very general. You want to go such unfoldings until you can reach the base case. So what's the base case? t1. So you want to eventually reach t1. And then you can imagine, you can see that the pattern over here. You got so many plus one over here, right? You got plus one, and then plus one, and all the way to plus one. How many plus one do we have? That's a question, right? So now we got to observe the pattern. What you will see is over here, you can see when it is minus one, you got just one term for plus one. When it is minus two, you got two plus one terms. And when it's minus three, you got one, two, and three, three terms. So now what about when it gets to 1? You have to rewrite it in a way such that it can follow the same pattern. We know that 1 over here is simply just n minus n minus 1. Agree? OK, good. That means how many plus 1 do we have? We got n minus 1 over here, n minus 1 term. So eventually, it's just going to be n minus 1, which is big O of n, as you said. Your answer is right, but you have to know how to unfold it. right? I would say if you're given anything like this, I would say the most complicated one we may ask you to do would be like a binary search, where, you, where you, the, uh, the number of unfolding will just be log n. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. I would say typically you can, you can just put one. It doesn't really matter if you put one or you put two or three. They are just constant. Yeah. To be very formal, maybe what you have, maybe what you should put is you just put c as a c, right? Eventually, what you will get is you get m minus 1 times c. But in this case, you can drop the uh, lower term and multiplicative constant. In that case, it will be m. Yes. Yeah. But you know, for this course, we don't want, we, you don't have to be this formal. Yeah, it's only, uh, we kind of introduce the idea for this at the end. You will do more in 2011 and 3101 specifically. Okay. Guys, any question about recursion here? For the lab seven solution, are you comfortable with all the solutions? Anything you want me to go over? Unless you haven't looked at them yet, you may want to. Okay, that's what I can tell you. You may want to. Okay, but of course, don't memorize. Right, that's not the way to go. Any question you want me to go over for lab seven? You can uh, just say, and I'll go over before I go back to the Google Doc. You're fine, right? Okay. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is you want to watch for. The way we do the uh, helper method for the uh, recursive helper method, especially, I'll give you one example quickly, you know, and then I will leave you alone for that. Okay, let's say for example, let's say for this particular example over here, what you really want to get comfortable with is, you can see that let's say we want to calculate this particular problem over here. Okay, let me just make sure. Okay, so we are trying to calculate Fibonacci array of size n. Okay, that's the original problem. You want to get very comfortable with to say this method here is going to make a call to some recursive helper method, in which case it has one extra argument, which will tell you which index to look at right, in, in, uh, in the same array. So that means we're going to have another array over here. Uh, that's the helper method. And this will be the extra argument over here. So that's really the key when you want to prove for correctness. So to, for something similar to this, you can look at the example I posted yesterday about it's sorted for the array. Okay, that's the only thing I want to highlight. 
So that's kind of the uh, key elements you want to pay attention to in the solution. Okay? And if you still want to practice more about recursion, you can do coding bat. Right? So that's a website I recommend it to you. You can go back to the recursion lecture slides, and then there's a link to it. Yes. Yeah. You don't have to. No, you don't have to. I would say what you really put on the original method here. Okay. So basically, what it meant was, so what you really put inside this method over here, or uh, versus how, what you put inside this method over here is completely up to you. I'll give you one example. You can see that over here we say that if n is equal to two, right? We simply put in the original method rather than in the helper method. We're saying that if it's simply equal to two, that means this is a sequence that we would like to, uh, you know, return directly, right? What you could have done, you can try that as, as an exercise. Okay? We can actually somehow code this particular branch of case inside this particular method. It's actually possible. How? What you can do is over here. Let's add a branch. Okay. Let's say I want to replace this branch completely. And then I can simply move it to here. How do I do that? Okay, to here. I can simply say if i is equal to 2 and the sequence the length equals equals 2. Oh, actually, that's not what I meant. If i is simply just equal to 2. In that case, I can do something over here to encode it. I can verify that by yourself by running some tests. I'm just saying it is OK to actually move that case into some helper method. You don't have to put it there. It's just in a matter of choice. OK. Any questions about this? OK, good. If you're comfortable with lab 7, that's good. And let's go back to the uh, Google Doc quickly, and then we can ask more. Okay, let's see. Let's go back here. I mean, I, okay, nothing new here. So let me just go back to here. Let me, let me see if there's anything. Huh? Oh, you can just ask now. You don't have to put it there. I, once I go uh, finish this, I'm going to go back to, uh, let me see this. This one we have covered, GCD. Okay. By the way, there will be no typecast. As I said, you know, on Friday. But you have to know everything else for inheritance. No typecast. Okay. Okay, what do we do over here? Let's see. I believe there's something to do with Okay, we also went over exceptions in quite much detail the other day. Okay. Okay, so this question over here. How about just this? Uh, I'll just mention this very quickly. So it, it's included in your review lecture for the first week about static. Okay. So for this particular question here, it's really about what's the meaning for static attributes. Okay. So now I'm going to review very quickly. But if you want, you can definitely. I will tell you where to go for some detailed accounts for this. Okay. How do we understand static? The simplest example to see is a counter. Okay? Let's say we have class counter. How about counter one versus counter two? Okay? And over here, let's say we got integer value, and over here we got void increments. Okay? And then I would say V plus plus. Let's make a very good comparison over here, just as simple as that. This is a simple example to show. Versus the green one over here, let's say we got class counter2. The only thing I'm going to modify would be I'll add a keyword over here, static, integer, also v. And then over here, I can say void increments and v++. plus plus. Oops. Good. Okay, these are the two classes, uh, except that I gotta close that properly. Okay, the only difference between these two classes is really this particular keyword for static. That's the only difference. 
Okay, let's see very similar, well, the same, almost identical tester code, and then see what's going to be the difference, okay? And now exp explain the meaning for static. First of all, let's say I say counter, counter one, and then I'll say C1 is new counter one, initially just zero. And then I also got counter one, let's say C2 is new counter one. Okay, let's say I got that. I got something very similar here, let me write it down. Let's say counter two, C3. New counter two, okay, I'll just save some wording here. So counter two, C4 is new C2. Okay, so far very identical. Now, what I would do is like this. If I say something like this, if I say C1, if I say C1 dot value over here, uh, let me say print. Print C1 dot value, and then I would say C1 dot increments. Let me make it even better, okay? And then we can say print C2 dot value, and then what I would do is I would say C1 dot increments. Okay, that'll be good enough. And then I'm gonna repeat the same two lines of code. Okay, like that. Let's do this one first, and then we'll do the green one. Actually, I believe this is a better, this is a very fast way. Let me just try. I remember I tried it once, but okay, I put it here, and then I can say, just give me 20 seconds. I believe I can say color here, and then I can put it into green. Good. And then I would say over here, C, uh, so where I say C1, I would say C2. Okay. Okay, C3, C4, C3, the value, C4, the value. Okay, that's a complete test case. Now, what we want to really see is, do you think the, the test code is going to print out different things? To the console, but it's going to be the same between the two. Okay, how about we look at that first? Okay, so now what about static? Static really means there's only a single copy for this particular variable for all the instances, or on the other hand, uh, uh, put in other words, all the instances for this particular class for counter two. They all share the same copy for this particular static variable. That's what it means when you say static. Okay, I'll write it, write it down. So static simply means all instances share the same copy. Whereas this is non-static because there's no static. So now you can say each instance has its own copy. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. But now, let's see, according to this, how do we trace the program one by one? Okay, let's say the first one. If I do C1 and C2, so that means over here, C1 is pointing to a uh, counter one. I would say counter one objects. In which case, I'll just get zero to begin with, okay? That's what, it, that's what it does for this line. And then I got another line, uh, another, the second line, C2 is pointing to another counter objects with value and then also zero, okay? So now you can see that because the value is non-static, that means C1 and C2, they got different copies of the value, different copies, they don't share. Okay, that's something we did uh, briefly in, uh, in 1022, okay? So now that means over here, the print value, C1 the value would be zero. C to the value will also be zero. Now, what if we say C1 dot increments? 
So you have to know which copy of the value is being modified. Well, should be belonging to the context object, right? So that will be C1 value over here. So that will be incremented by 1. So that means after that, C1 the value will be 1. C2 the value remains the same because it's still the same copy over here. That's unmodified. So this is the case where the value is non-static. Okay? Now, in the case where it is static, it's going to be in some way simpler, but you got to be very careful when you trace the code. The way you trace it will be a little bit different. Okay? It's going to be like this. So now, how do we visualize these two? So now, when you visualize C3 and C4, they're going to actually point to some counter two objects, counter two objects, and counter two objects. But now, the way you visualize each object in this case will be a little bit different. We used to simply include a field over here called V for each object. It's not the case anymore because the attribute is static. That means it should set, a law, uh, set aside. Let's say I will simply put over here just a class. Just modify just a single copy. So this will be counter 2. And then it has V. Initially, simply just 0. OK, set aside. So this copy here is really shared by all the instances of counter 2. And now let's try this. Okay? So initially, if you say C3 the value and C4 the value, C3 and C4 initially should just be 0 because you're referring to the same copy of the value, right? So now, if you say oh, over here, if you say C3 the increments, so now we are modifying basically this particular copy, right? To say 1. So when you say C3 the increments, you're saying C3 is going to modify, but the, the copy doesn't just belong to C3. It belongs to the entire class. There's only a single copy. So you actually modify from 0 to 1. So that means after that, when you say C3 and C4 the value, it should be 1. 1 and 1. OK, can you see the difference? So it's as if we got aliasing over here. They all point to the same copy of the value in the case of static. One more thing to say. In the case where the attributes is static, that means the attribute value belongs to the class rather than belonging to a particular context objects. That is why you can also alternatively write something like this. So rather than writing uh, C3 the value and C4 the value, you can write something like this. What you can write is counter2, which is the class name. Counter2 dot value. That's also possible. Okay? Hopefully that's kind of fresh. Uh, not, well, you, still, you can recall that from your 1022. On the other hand, because now C1, uh, in this case, the value over here is non-static. You cannot just use a class name to refer to it. Okay? That's about static attributes. So if you go back to the original question over there uh, on the Google Doc, so now it should be has only one copy for the attributes. So that should be B. Okay, so now it should be quite obvious. The answer should be B. Okay? Are we okay with the static attributes over here? Okay? Now, if you really want to review the entire thing with a little more complicated example, this is where you can go. Okay, I'll show you where you can go. So we don't have to waste time now. So if you go to 1022, for example, I believe I talked about it in the very last lecture. So you can just go to the middle part of the lecture. Just go to the recording, and then you can see that particular example for static attributes, okay? if you want. OK, that's about this one here. And then, OK, this is an, another question. Let me make it a little bit bigger. OK, so now we got some recursive implementation of a merge sort, which we talked about in the last class, merge sort. So let's just look at the uh, method over here. Okay, let me make the indentation a little bit better. OK, return. And then we got, basically, we just have to formulate the running time. Let's do it again. How about that? It's actually very similar to what we did uh, in the class. But let's just use this example over here. OK, so now, let's see what should be the running time for that. Again, for every recursive method you're given, doesn't matter how simple or how difficult it is, you should always include two kinds of equations in your uh, formulation. One would be base cases, the other one would be uh, recursive cases, right? 
So now, let's talk about base cases. How many base cases do we have? Well, actually, I should highlight to give you hints. How many? Just one, right? Well, according to the branch, right, is when the size is equal, uh, less than or equal to one. But this question is a little bit tricky because we know that the list can be empty or it can be containing just one element. So there are really two cases over here, right? So now what we can do is, uh, let me just, so the base case tells you if t dot size less than or equal to one, in that case, you just return t, right? That's what you have. Now, how do we formulate this to, a rec uh, to an equation? Basically, there are two possibilities. T dot size can be zero and can be one. Both will satisfy the uh, branch. So that means writing time for input case is zero or the input size is one. And return T is just a constant. Well, we can just say one. Okay, that's about the base case. What about the recursive case over here? Well, for the merge sort, you just have to figure out exactly where the recursive, the recursion is made, right? If you look at that, uh, just very briefly, it's very similar to what we said in the class. So these two lines are making the recursive call. Agree? These two lines, right? So these two are calling the merge sort, okay? So what we have is for these two lines, you can see that what's the problem size? You can see we're just having a sublist, and then the way we do it is by going from index zero, the first index, until the middle one, which is only about half size, right? And then we go for the second half. So each one of them is dealing with a sub-problem that's strictly smaller by reducing the size. So let's formulate these two. So the way we do it is by saying, you say merge sort, and then you just have a sublist. And then the size is simply just like a halfway. Okay, I'm just sketching out the idea. And then you got another merge sort recursive call. That's just another sublist. And that's also of size n over two. Right? This is the left half, and this is the right half. Okay, left and right, okay? How do we formulate this, each one of them? This one will be t of n minus two, right, conceptually, right? And this will be t n over two. Now, we need to go to another, the last line over here. The last line is about merging. And we also talk about merge. Also, you did merge for your lab seven. So merge should be quite familiar to you. So now, what should be the running time, really? Basically, for the merge, if you got two lists over here, let's say list number one, which is left, and list number two is right. Individually, they are sorted, right? We want to merge them so that they become a larger sort sorted list. This is of size n over two, and this is of size n over two. Basically, we gotta go over from left to right for each list one by one, and what we want to do is to fit up a list that is strictly larger, basically, of size n. Okay, we're gonna choose maybe one element from here and then put it here, another element from here and put it over here and go on to fit up all the elements in the, in the list. So conceptually, how many times do you have to fill up the list? N times, it's a loop, okay? So now for merge, it's gonna be big O of N. We know that, right? So now what we want to do is basically to really combine these three together. This this and this. So these correspond to basically uh, these three lines for the recursive case, okay? So we want to add them up together, so what you will get is something like this, okay? You will just simply get T, so there'll be two times of this, two times T of a uh, half size problem over here plus the merge, which is N, okay? That's, that's it. So that's the recursive case. Uh, of course, that's T N equals. Okay, so you got the three, we got two base cases over here, and also you got your recursive case over here in the formulation. So three equations for the running time. Of course, you can unfold it as well, which we briefly talk about on Monday. You can also try, okay? Any question about this particular problem here? Are we okay? Okay, okay, all right. All right, and we just talked about this, okay? I thought this was, this was asked in the Moodle, right? Yeah. How do we distinguish between alias and shallow copy? Yeah. So are you okay with that? 
You didn't put, oh, it's somebody else, I guess. Okay. Okay, I can answer it again. What's the difference between alias and shallow copy? Well, anybody want to try? And I can criticize on your answer. Anyone want to try? Uh, give me one moment. Give me one moment. Let me give you a little bit of hints, uh, direction. Shallow copy and aliasing. Okay? Oh, yes, thank you. Very good, yes. Okay. So shallow copy versus aliasing, right? So now, now uh, what, let me ask you this way uh, before you say, okay? Does shallow copy depend on aliasing or does aliasing depend on shallow copy? Okay, the first right. Okay, good, very good. So that means when you do shallow copy over here, you have to do aliasing. But how exactly? Yeah, basically, shallow copy usually use a copying constructor, and then in the comp copy constructor, you're gonna use the equal sign assignment for every attributes. If the attribute is reference type, you just copy the uh, reference. So that will create aliasing. So aliasing is a very uh, general concept. Whenever you got a single object which got more than one arrow pointing to it, that means the address is copied over by different variables. In that case, that's aliasing. And the way we achieve shallow copy is by using aliasing. Okay, that's a very quick answer to it. But you can definitely refer, uh, refer to our slides for that. Okay, apart from this, uh, yeah, let me just see this. Can you go over counting primitive type? Primitive operation, I suppose. Specifically counting nested for loops. Okay, so I would suggest for this one here, I'll give you one example over here. This is what you should really pay attention to. Let's say we go to asymptotic analysis I believe it's one of the last example. Let me see. Let's see this. I'll just give you some little bit hints over here. Yes. Now, let's say this is one of the examples we did in the class. Let's say you're given this again. Actually, you were given one in the lab test two, right? Also, you were given some practice problem for lab test two. So what I would say is, especially when you get nested loop, the critical thing is you want to look at the pattern for the loop counters, okay? In this case, specifically, you got counter i, you got counter j. We know that the number of iterations for this outer loop depends on the value for i, right? And the number of the inner iterations over here depends on the value for j. And j's value also depends on i, where j is initialized to be i, right? Let me just do this one again very quickly. All you got to do is, we know that i's value can be starting with 0, right? In the case where i is 0, how many values of j will be used inside this particular body for the inner loop? How many? When i is 0. For this particular example. Let's say i is initialized to be 0, so we got 0 over here. That means j is assigned to 0 for the very first time. Now, do we get to use the value for j inside this body of the loop? Do we? for the very first time. Huh? Yeah, something like that, right? It also depends on n over here, right? Because j is less than n, which means j will start from 0 until n. So that means j will be 0 all the way to n minus 1. That'll be last iteration, good? And then, apart, okay, let's do one more. When i's value is incremented to 1, in that case, j's value will be starting with 1, so that means you go from 1 until n minus 1, right? So you go like this. You go on, and then when i, the last value for i will be n minus 1, because it's still strictly less than n. So when i is actually equal to n minus 1, now in this case, how many values do we get to use for j? Uh, just 1, right? Just because you'll be initialized to be n minus 1, right? Okay, n minus 1, and then when you get to n, you wouldn't satisfy this particular uh, condition over here. It would just be false. Okay, that's something we discuss in details in the class. Okay, now, let's count. How do we count the number of times we're going to execute a body for this summation, uh, this line number 5? Well, itself, you can see that array indexing and also doing some arithmetic, some assignments, we know that this is simply just constant. 
and now we want to know how many times this particular constant operation is executed. The way to do it is to think about how many times the value for j is actually being used, right? Because every, for every different value for j, you're going to apply that into this particular expression here. Now, for the very first time, for I, when i is equal to 0, we got from 0 to n minus 1, we got n, right? And then for the second time when i is equal to 1, in that case, we get to use so many values for j. In that case, that'll be n minus 1, OK? All the way to here, we only get to use the value for j being n minus 1. So that'd be only one value over here. So that's why you got this summation series over here, this many. So you got this many, and then each one of them is going to be big O of 1. So you do multiplication, that's why you get n squared. Okay? A very quick uh, review of what we covered in detail previously. But I can refer to a lecture recording if you're not comfortable with this. Any question about this example here? Just this, this example before I take new questions. Good. Okay, I think before I take your question here, just what, just what you put, okay? Sure. So, Yes, you know what? I would. Uh, I'm. I don't mind going to the uh, practice practice exam, but I would say don't go too much into it. It's mainly the format we want you to get used to. I can talk about some questions, yes, but before I before I go into it, how about this? Before I go into it, any other question on the slides or general concept? So you wouldn't mind I go to the sample exam, right? Okay, that's fine. Uh, is that's a question number? Okay. Sure, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, let, let's do it together. Okay. Uh, so there's a question number, right? Okay, let's do it. Okay, 13. I may just tell me the number, so I'll go there. Uh, 13. Okay. What, oh, I see. What is the main purpose of, purpose of testing, okay? I tell you what, okay. In CS, when you say proof, you gotta be very careful. When you say proof, we are really talking about the kind of formal proof you did in 1019 or 1090. It's very formal. So now, let, let me just give you one example. Okay, for testing. That's something I didn't really explicitly mention in, uh, in the lecture, okay. Uh, let, me, let me have a, fa uh, there's a very famous quote, I'll write it here. Testing can only show the presence of box, software box, right? but cannot prove its absence. Can you read the sentence for me and then to see if that makes sense to you? Is it, I didn't make this up. It's a very famous quote. Cannot prove its absence. So that means the best you can do by using test, depending on the quality of your test and how complete your test cases are, okay? is you can only show that, oh, for this particular test case, actually, I can show you your software failed. Well, not pointed exception, or array index, uh, index out of bound exception. But realistically, you can never expect your test cases to really prove you never have bug. It's simply not possible. I'll just give you one example, okay? Let's say this. Let's say we have, let's say we have two classes, let's say. Let's say class, let's say counter one. Again, counter one, counter two. Integer v, okay? And then class, I just want to give you a feel. It's something called combinatorial explosion, okay? But what I'm talking about now, don't worry, it's not in the exam. I just want for you for your knowledge, since you asked me, okay? Now, let's say this, and then we have Let's say integer, uh, let's say we have a void method over here called 
increments. Let's say for counter 1, we only support increments. And now for counter 2, we only support decrements. So now, how do I fully test these two counters? Is it ever possible? Fully. When I say, OK, there are, there are several issues over here. If I want to fully test these two counters, number one, I want to make sure I cover all the possible starting value for counter one and counter two before I try to do increment or decrements. How many possibilities are there? Well, how many possible values are there for integer? Oh, what was, uh, remember, how many bits are there? 32 bits, right? So that means we can get 2 to the third of 32. All right? And similarly, also for integer here, also 2 to the 32. To really claim that your test case is somehow uh, complete, you have to give 2 to the 32 multiply 2 to the 32 test cases. Do you think you will ever want to do it? No, not really, right? Well, well, I'm just talking about in theory, if you really want to prove, right? All, you got to try all the possible values exhaustively. That's only one concern. You know? So this will be value for counter one, this will be value for counter two. You're gonna, each J unit test method is going to try different combination of the two values. And more to that, the way you actually call the interleaving for the two methods. For example, when I say C1 dot increments versus uh, C1 dot increments, C2 dot decrements, this is one pattern for the methods, right? Another pattern would be maybe C, uh, C2 dot decrements followed by C1 dot decrements. That's just another pattern. And the way you can actually derive these patterns will just be, in theory, infinite. So it's just never possible for you to actually uh, prove. Yeah. Yeah, that's that kind of lesson you give her. That's why I say don't get too much into it, right? But I think that there will be something you will learn anyway. So that's why I, I kind of bother mentioning. So one thing you want to keep in mind, for 2011, for example, you might be asked to implement some data structures that may not be spoon-feed you anymore by giving you the JUnit test. That means you have to test by yourself. And how can you be reasonably confident with your code? You have to make sure you give some reasonably complete and quality tests to test your data structure, OK? Anyway. Kind of uh, overdue this question already. Okay, next one. 14. Sure. I think this one is only about choosing the uh, the boundary cases, right? Okay. Very well. The quest, uh, The answer is A, B, and C, right? You're you're wondering why B should be there, right? Yeah. Which which option bother you? Okay, how about this? Conceptually, we know that it's good. You're, gonna, you're going to count for is A plus, right? A plus, we know that it is larger than or equal to 90. Yeah. So when we say boundary, we mean exactly on the line, above the line, or below the line, yeah. basically, right? In that case, you, you got 90 over here, which is A, uh, which is B, and also you got 89, which is also AB. AB should, for sure should be included. C is because you have, you got to be very careful, there's a precondition over here to say gray is less than or equal to 100. So that means you might give some value, you want to make sure you always give a value that's less than or equal to 100. Okay. Yes. So why, is why is A included? Yeah, it's because, ah, good question. Because we know that, um, because, okay, think, think, it's a very good question. Think it this way. Let's say this is the, Cut off. Let's say when I do your calculation for 2030, right? Let's say the cutoff would be just 90 over here. That means your grade is exactly on the line or above. That's how you get 90. So 90 and 91, for example, they kind of consider as boundary cases. But now there's also another kind of boundary case, which would mean the first value to make this property false. Let's say you happen to get 89, for example, over here. That means you wouldn't get A plus. That's why it's all the boundary case. That's also a very good uh, heuristics for you to follow. Let's say later on, if you want to test for your data structure, you should always test, for example, collection. You should always test for empty collection, collection of size one, 
a collection of maybe the maximum is 10. You should also test for size 10 or try to do size 11, which will trigger some exception. So those are the boundary cases you want to worry about. So boundary cases like this, you want to think it this way. Let me think a little bit more conceptually, right? That's kind of the strategy you want to adopt. Let's think about, let's, say, let's think it this way. Let's say for it's A plus. We want to think about what are the, all the values that is going to be valid for this method to be, to you do, really do some computation. We know that it should be one. It can be zero, two, three, four, maybe up to 89, 90, 91, 99. However, as soon as we get to 100, that's the last value that's allowed. Once you get to 100, and one, we know that that's considered an invalid input. So uh, boundary number one. This is the boundary for valid input for you to consider, which means if you give me one, uh, one, 101, I don't re it really tell you true or false. It's simply not possible to get one, one, uh, 101 as marks. Okay, that's boundary number one. Okay, boundary number two. You can subdivide the valid values into different categories. For example, let's say over here, so these are, over here, you can see 90, 91, up to 99, 100. So these are the values where you should really return true for its A plus, right? On the other hand, the rest should be the ones you simply just return false. So you're really dividing your input value into different categories for you to, to uh, really test. You want to make sure, in general, I mean, again, this is outside the uh, scope. I just want to sh share with you. You can distribute to Google, there's something called equivalence class for testing. So we are saying that, given that we got three equivalent classes over here, either strictly larger than 100, in which case it can be 101, 102, 103. And equivalent class number two, it can be anything from zero until 89. That's class number two. And class number three, it can be any values that's starting from 90 until 100. So now, how can you know that your test cases are good enough. You want to make sure you choose at least one value from each class. For example, again, if I give you the following question, that would be actually a valid question. Let's say for this particular method, let's say if I, I give you two options, option A and option B. Option A, I'm being very ambitious. I simply test its A plus on the following inputs. I test for 0, 1, 2, all the way to 89. I test 80, uh, I test 90 values in my, I got 90 test cases, okay, 90 test cases. On the other hand, for another one, I test for 1, 93, and also 102. If you only consider the number of test cases, 90 versus 3, you might think, wow, maybe uh, option A is much better, because I'm testing with much many more test cases. But now, since we understand this kind of division a little bit more, which one do you think is better? Why B? Yeah, some, well, basically you can see B here, even though we got much less test cases. However, you can see one over here covers this particular equivalent class. And 93 over here covers just another one, which means testing zero and testing one will be considered as equivalents because they be belong to the same category. Right? But now here, 1, 93, and 102, you cover all the possible three categories. So you say that to test each, basically. Yeah, you can think about, roughly speaking. Yeah. Huh? Why not D? You know what? That's why I said don't go a little bit Go, don't go too much into it. If I were to ask the question, I would have been a little bit more asking a little bit differently. So, yeah. But I think uh, when you say testing boundary cases, basically you want to, you, when you got any input conditions, or when you got any uh, condition to say, be, above this condition, I'll return true, below this condition, I'll return false, you want to test for all the boundaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Make sense to you? Yeah. Good. But, you know, I would say, you wouldn't really learn about something called equivalent classes unless you choose a, the software testing class, uh, course in the fourth year. So I would say if you're interested in about improving your JUnit's selection strategy, wiki this, okay? Look it up in Wikipedia. It's called equivalent class. There's a particular way of testing your software by coming up with equivalent classes.
Yes. What do you mean? Question three? Thirty. Okay, uh, are we okay with this question here? Can I leave you alone for that? Okay, good. Uh, which page? Uh, page 12, thank you. Sorry, just it's kind of harder to move. Yeah, 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 I know. Inheritance, okay, let's do it, let's do it. Inheritance is important, very important. There we go. Oh, that's the question itself, right? Yeah, it's based on the code here. Okay. So, okay, we got these. Okay, what about it? I wasn't sure how to do 29, 30, 30, 30, 30. Let me see this. Let me just have a look at this very quickly. Okay. So, as soon as you see this kind of decoration over here, okay, this is how you can, you can draw some diagram right away. Okay, this is what, how I would, I haven't seen the question, so. This is how I would do it. So first of all, we got a class over here. It's called adult cat. Okay, where we got some meth, uh, constructor over here. I'll simply say adult cat. Okay, integer size. Okay, I'll put it here. And then we got another method here, set size. Okay, void set size, which means statically speaking, if your static type is adult cat, you can definitely call set size. Right? That's it. And then we got another one we call a lion. In which case, we got uh, just another constructor over here called lion, integer, size. And then, okay, I suppose it will be something to do with super, I guess. Okay, I don't know, maybe. And then we got override over here. And then we'll say void. Set size. That means if the static type happens to be lion, you're actually going to call, you, you are able to call set size. But if the dynamic type is actually lion, you make sure you call this version rather than this version. Okay, something to do with that with dynamic binding. Okay, having this in mind, so what I would do is, I'm gonna copy this. Can I actually do that? I'm not too sure. But I wonder if I can just uh, paste to the next page. That's something I'm not too sure. From here, right? 3031? Oh, I can. That's good. Okay. So the precondition for of the lion version of the set size is, is, is incomplete. Which of the following can be used to complete a precondition so that a lion is substitutable for adult cat? I tell you what, this one is a little bit too difficult for you. Okay. Since we didn't talk about it. That's not I tell you what, how about this? I promise if you take 3311 with me, we have a whole lecture on this. Okay? okay? So. Take my word for this. For this particular question about precondition in the subclass, you don't have to worry. Okay? But I got other things to worry about, of course. 31? Okay, then you don't have to worry. Yeah. 40? One moment, one moment. 40? Oh, so what's this? Oh, what do you expect the big old complexity of merge sort? No, and log in. Did he give you a particular version for merge sort? What do you expect it to be? No, that should be n log n. No, seriously, you don't have a, merge sort cannot be n. No, 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 maybe it's a typo. Yeah, don't worry, yeah, this question particularly is not in the, on the exam, don't worry, yeah. But yeah, you have to understand merge sort, of course, yeah. Merge sort should be n log n, yeah. You mean what's the benefit of using static? Uh, import, static. Import, you mean the import statements? Yeah, import static. In our lab test? No, not our lab test. Then don't worry about it. If we didn't talk about it, you don't have to worry. Okay. 
Okay, we still have time, maybe 10 minutes, if you got more questions for me. Uh, for today, maybe not. I got some meetings, uh, you know, with the uh, in, in departments. But tomorrow, I'll try to make, make, make myself available for one hour or two, maybe one hour. I'll announce that tonight, okay, if you need it. Huh? Which one? Uh, 17. 17, yeah, sure. I haven't looked at the exam myself, so yeah. 17. Seventeen. Oh, this one here, interesting. Okay, question for you, okay? Actually, this one's interesting. I, I looked at it yesterday, yeah. Okay, uh, let me mark, mark uh, let me just make it more focused for you. It's actually interesting to do it together. So now, Basically, what this method will do is it's going to calculate the average, not really for the entire list of double. Only calculate the average for those elements whose uh, number is larger than 10, for example. Let's say if I, if I have this, okay? Let's say I got 1, 2, 3, 10, uh, 4, and then 20. In this case, the average would be the average between 10 and 20 which would be 15. Okay, now, are you sure you understand why the answer is E? No. Actually, how about this? Let me ask you this. What if I got an array like this? Okay, let's say I got this array over here. Uh, just list, doesn't matter. Let's say I got one, two, three, four, five. Let's say this is uh, the list, I'll say A. And now I'm calling this, stop, uh, this average method here, I'll, I'll simply pass A. What is it going to return? Zero divided by zero, which will be? Uh, mathematically, it's uh, infinite, right? You should never do it, right? Yeah, you, what you will get is a division by zero exception. Are you sure you don't know, know about that? Well, no, 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 zero by zero divided by zero is not good. Okay, uh, the, 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 the main thing you want to look at is, you can see the number of values that will be larger than, uh, larger than 10 is actually initialized to be zero. If you, if you never get a chance to increment it over here, which is under the condition over here, that means it remains to be zero. That means when you get to here, it's just div division by zero. You bet. You may want to review your elementary school math. <laughs> oh, by the way, don't ask me, uh, Casey, you know what, don't ask me in doing the exam, what would be the result of one divided by zero? I'm, I'm not gonna tell you. Yeah, what they're saying, right? Doesn't really. All right, anyway, guys, any more questions? No, are you sure?